Well, hi everybody. We are back with chapter eight of Shaking the Nickel Bush. Chapter eight is called Back Country. It was mid-afternoon on my 20th birthday when we pulled away from the hotel in Phoenix, and I think Lonnie was the proudest man in Arizona. Shiftless's engine started up with a roar when he pulled the throttle open, and she bucked a little when he let the pedal back and threw her into high, but once we were rolling, she perked along as steady as a trotting horse. We were making about 15 miles an hour as we headed for the outskirts to pick up the eastbound highway, and Lonnie was watching the road and twisting the wheel back and forth as if we'd been making 55. What did I tell you, buddy? He called out above the rattle of the fenders and the squeaking of the springs. Didn't I tell you I'd fix her up good as new? Listen to the sound of that motor, would you? Ticking like a five-dollar watch. But I ain't gonna press her none, not while her guts are brand new. Don't aim to go no further in Superior tonight. From there we'll get out into the back country and find us a couple of good jobs. We'd better, I told him. I've only got twenty-four twenty left in my pocket. There wasn't any sense in telling him about the fifty and the cuff of, cuff of my Levi's. Jeepers, Lonnie shouted. You must have did better than you told me in the horse falls, buddy. I reckoned you'd be dang near dead broke by now. What with all the little extra parts we had to buy and all, but shucks, with 2420 and all the grub we've got, we're set for the winter, even if we don't find no jobs. Old Shiftless, she won't cost us nothing from now on. Only two bits for gas now and again. Betcha she'll make 25 miles or more on the gallon. Don't forget, if we don't get any jobs soon, I told him. Er, or excuse me, she'd better if we don't get any jobs pretty soon, I told him. Don't forget, I have to go to the doctor every week, and they seem to have a standard price of two dollars. Lonnie took one hand off the wheel long enough to reach over and slap me on the shoulder. Look, buddy, he told me, you don't have to worry none about the dough. Like I told you, I'll toss my paychecks into the pot, the whole work exceptin' for a buck or two for makings and the like, till I've paid you back every dime you've spent up till now. Way I look at it, I got more need for an automobile than what you have, so I'll just buy you out and take shiftless off in your hands. That way I could furnish the car and you could furnish the gas and it would be a 50-50 deal. Horse would split whatever little it cost us for grub when we ain't working steady. There's no need of that, I told him. If you pay half, that's plenty, and when we're done with it, you can have it. I'm going back to Colorado in the spring and I wouldn't have any use for an automobile there even if I knew how to drive one. It's a deal, buddy, Lonnie shouted. It's a deal. He drove on for a quarter of a mile or so. Then without taking his eyes off the road, he asked, Say, buddy, how much do I have to kick in for we put the papers in partnership? Five bucks, I said. Wasn't that what I told you when we bought her? Uh-huh, I know. But I wasn't sure, sure you'd remember, he said. You understand, buddy, I ain't talking about buying in havers for five bucks. It's just... Well, it's just that I'd be mighty proud to have my name wrote down on the records as half-owner of an auto automobile. A good one, the likes of what shiftless is now we got her fixed up. That's all right, I said. I'll go and have your name registered along with mine whenever you pay the first five. We were already out of town, and Lonnie was sort of herding shiftless along a gravel road. Sometimes she'd wander over to the right side, and sometimes over to the left, and Lonnie would spin the wheel just in time to keep her from wandering off into the desert. He got so excited he didn't stop her in time when I told him about having his name registered with mine. He threw an arm around my neck, hauled my head onto his shoulder, and told me, You're a buddy, that's what you are. And look, buddy, I'll never leave you down, not while there's an inch of skin left on these hands. That won't be long, I yelled, unless you watch where you're going. The instant Shiftless had caught Lonnie off guard, she'd headed for the desert, and in pulling away from my arm, happened to hit the throttle lever and push it wide open. Shiftless let out a roar, plunged down over a low bank at the side of the road, and took off, bouncing and swaying toward a big bunch of greasewood and cactus. Lonnie had all he could do to fight the wheel and keep us out of the cactus, and before he could get a hand free to pull the th throttle back, we were a hundred yards from the road, right in the middle of a lake of loose sand six or seven inches deep. It had happened so fast that Lonnie never thought about his feet until he'd pulled the throttle up. Then he hit the brake pedal so hard he nearly drove it through the floorboards. For a second I thought I was in the horse falls again and that Shiftless was going to somersault, but she didn't. She just slewed around to one side and stopped dead, engine and all. Lonnie started to yell at me, then caught himself. Don't never touch the throttle when I'm driving, he told me in sort of a shaky voice. If I hadn't caught a hold the wheel right when I did, we could have been in bad trouble. Well, don't grab me around the neck again when you're driving, I told him. And it looks to me as if we're already in bad trouble. No, we ain't, he said, but we're lucky that nothing got busted. Go give the crank a spin before we settle too deep into this doggone sand. The crank wouldn't spin. 
All I could do was engage it near the bottom of the turn and jerk it up, but nothing happened. After I'd jerked it a dozen times or more, Lonnie climbed out and opened the hood. Flooded, he told me. There's gas leaking out the top of the carburetor. Maybe I shouldn't ought to have goosed her. Turn her over a few more times and it'll drain away. The engine was so tight that I nearly had to lift shiftless off her front wheels every time I yanked the crank handle up, and it took 15 or 20 more yanks before the engine backfired and started. When I climbed back in beside Lonnie, I was so winded I couldn't say a word. He retarded the spark and fiddled around with the throttle till the engine stopped backfiring, then let the in-gear lever down and stepped on the low-speed pedal. We didn't move, but I could feel Shiftless's hind end swaying a bit as if she were a horse switching at flies. Lonnie held the low pedal down hard and opened the throttle little by little, but nothing happened except that Shiftless seemed to be hunkering down on her haunches. Lonnie put her back into neutral and we both got out to see what the trouble was. Shiftless had dug her hind wheels in clear to the hubcaps and looked as though she were getting ready to sit down. Well, Lonnie said, we've got to dig her out, that's all. Wish we'd remember to bring along a shovel. What have we got to dig with? You can use the dishpan, I told him, and I'll use the iron pot. Will we have to dig all the way to the edge of this sand pit? Nah, he said, just a couple of feet in front of each tire, just enough so the hind legs can get a hold on the ground. We scooped out a trough between the wheels and for six or seven feet ahead of the front ones, then Lonnie climbed in and gave her the gun. Shiftless slithered and switched tail till she came to the end of the troughs, then bucked on for a few feet and dug her heels in again. We tried the scooping four or five times more, but it always worked the same way. Then Lonnie decided it would be better if we cut brush and made a corduroy road for the wheels to run on. It did work better, but it was slow going because Lonnie had to stop every two lengths while I moved the road ahead. It was after sunset before we got shiftless out of the deep sand, and by that time she was boiling so hard she looked like a lo locomotive blowing off steam. But we were on our way. We'd made nearly six miles out of Phoenix, so I thought it was best for us to make camp right where we were. It's amazing how hungry scooping sand will make people, and camping out always seems to sort of whet their appetites. That night Lonnie fried himself a couple of big slices of ham, two potatoes, and three eggs and I warmed up the whole quart of stewed chicken Mrs. Larson had put up for me. I didn't plan to eat more than half of it for supper and to save the rest for breakfast, but Lonnie and I got talking as we ate, and before I realized it, I was scraping the last of the gravy out of the pot. It certainly made gluten bread taste a lot better than just eating it dry. The next day being Sunday, Lonnie didn't think we should start out too early, and it was nearly 10 o'clock before I could get him awake enough to roll out of his blankets. By that time, we were both hungrier than bears, so Lonnie fixed himself the same breakfast that he'd had for supper. Of course, I couldn't eat ham or potatoes, so I just boiled myself three eggs and finished up the first loaf of gluten bread. Shiftless was a little shaky about starting, but not bad, and by noon we were on the road for Superior again. I think we'd have made the whole 65 miles before dark if it hadn't been for Shiftless's boiling. She started in before we'd covered more than three miles, and from there on the day was sort of off again, on again. Even though it was the middle of December, the desert was as hot as summer. Every two miles we'd have to stop, drain out some of the boiling water, and add fresh from the can we'd brought along, and wait for shiftless to cool down. And every time we had to start her again, the hotshot battery was a little weaker, and it took more yanking on the crank handle before we'd get a spark strong enough to explode the gas. Worse still, the hotter shiftless got, the harder I had to jerk the crank to turn the engine over, and the more she smoked when we had her going. It was nearly dark when we pulled into Mesa, only about 20 miles from Phoenix, and anyone might have thought we were driving a freight engine instead of an automobile. The cloud of blue smoke pouring out of the exhaust pipe was just about equal to the cloud of white steam pouring out of the radiator. We'd long since bo stopped bothering to put the cap on the radiator. We'd long... No, we'd long since stopped bothering to put the cap on when we refilled, and we were entirely out of water, and the new parts had swelled enough from the heat that Lonnie was having to drive with the low speed pedal he held down. We'd made it just as far as the garage when Shiftless coughed a time or two and stopped. Even then she smelled like a red-hot stove. Out of oil and water? The garage man asked when he came out to see what we wanted. Lonnie tried to tell him we had plenty of oil and were only out of water because all the engine parts were new. But the man wouldn't believe him, and he was right. When he opened the petcock at the bottom of the engine, only a few drops of thick black oil dribbled out. In that 20 miles, we'd only burn two gallons of gasoline, but we'd burned nearly three quarts of oil, and it was 20 cents a quart. The garage man showed us where it had seeped up around the base of the spark plugs, and said we were pumping it up the scored cylinder walls like water out of a well. The only thing we could do was wait a couple of hours for shiftless to cool down, 
buy a couple of gallons of extra oil to take along, then camp as soon as we were out of town. While I was cooking supper, Lonnie told me he thought it would be better for Shiftless if we turned north and got away from the deserts until her new parts had worn in a little more. He said the best cattle ranches in the state were north of Globe, and that if we held to the northeast, it would bring us right in among the biggest of them. Anything sounded good to me that might lead to jobs before we went broke, but I told him there would be no more lying around camp until noon, that I wanted to be on the road by daylight so as to cover as many miles as we could in the cool of the morning. I had to bully Lonnie a bit, but we'd had breakfast and were on the road at the crack of dawn. For the first 20 miles, we drove almost straight east and shiftless behaved fairly well. Then soon after she started boiling, we came to a Y where the roads forked, one to the northeast toward the mountains and the other southeast across the desert. Lonnie hadn't been more than half awake since I rolled him out that morning, but he perked right up as soon as he swung shiftless onto the road heading northeast. Don't worry, you worry no more about shiftless boiling, buddy, he told me. Soon as ever we get into them mountains, she'll cool right down, and with all them new parts she's got in her, she'll pull like a team of mules. She did, like the most headstrong and balky team that ever lived, and within ten miles that road turned out to be the one that had been built only for mules. As soon as we got into the mountains, it twisted like a snake in agony, both sideways and up and down. On the downgrades, Shiftless would take off like a mule headed for the barn, weaving from side to side and picking up steam at every length. The only way Lonnie could hold her back enough to keep her on the road was by breaking up the hand, pulling up the handbrake and bracing himself against the footbrake pedal. If the upgrades weren't too steep, we could grind them out at low speed, then stop at the top of the hill while Shiftless blew off enough steam that I could get close to the radiator and refill it. By afternoon, we'd worked out a system for the steeper hills. Lonnie would stop on the downgrade a hundred yards or so before we reached the bottom of the gulch. Then I'd get out and run ahead till I was about halfway up the next hill. After I'd had time to catch my breath, he'd turn shiftless loose, come racing down to the bottom with her pitching and weaving, then give her the gun for the climb. By the time he reached me, he'd have slowed to three or four miles an hour, with his foot braced against the low pedal and the throttle wide open. Then with me pushing from the back, we could make it to the top before we came to a dead stop. By late afternoon, it was noticeable that our new engine parts were beginning to get worn in a little. Shiftless began pulling better on every hill, and she didn't boil so badly when we reached the top. Darkness was just beginning to settle when we came to a canyon that looked impossible to me. The road leading down into it twisted like a corkscrew, and on the far side it seemed to rise at a 45-degree angle until it curved out of sight around a mountain shoulder. Worse still, we'd worn out our handbrake, we were out of water, and the only person we'd seen since morning was a woman in a little hamlet eight or ten miles back. Let's camp right here and turn back in the morning, I told Lonnie. If we ever make it to the bottom, we'd never get up the far side, and we should... We should have an accident nobody would find us for a month of Sundays. Lonnie didn't like the idea at all. Jeepers creepers, buddy, he told me. There ain't no sense turning back now. Them big cattle ranches I told you about is just the other side of these hills. We're almost to them. Look, buddy, the way old Shiftless pulled that last hill, she'll go up that little one yonder on the fly. If you're scared, why don't you get out and walk? I can put her through there easy as pie. I was scared, but I didn't like to admit it. So I said, all right, but you stop halfway down. Then I'll go ahead and give you a push up the far side. You'll never make it without. Lonnie didn't stop halfway down. Shiftless acted as if she'd taken the bit in her teeth and was headed for home. With one foot on the brake pedal and the other on the reverse, Lonnie could no more hold her back than he could have held Niagara Falls. How he ever managed to hold her in the roadway is a miracle. From the time we plunged over the brink until we reached the bottom of the canyon, there was never a second when her hind wheels followed the front ones. She switch-tailed from side to side, flinging rocks down into the canyon at our left and side-swiping the cut bank at our right. I don't believe there was ever a moment she had all four wheels on the ground. All I could do was hang on, but Lonnie rode shiftless out as if she'd been a bucking bronco. Just as we reached the bottom of the canyon, he yanked the throttle wide open and sent her tearing up the far side. For the first hundred yards or so, she raced upwards as though she still had the bit in her teeth. Then as we rounded the first curve high on the cliffside, the engine began knocking and she slowed her pace. Without touching the wide open throttle, Lonnie jammed the low speed pedal to the floorboards. For a fraction of a second, Shiftless surged ahead, then stopped as though she'd seen something that frightened her and began rolling backwards, gaining speed at every turn of the wheels. Lonnie braced his back against the sheet and threw his full weight onto the low speed pedal, but Shiftless's only answer was an angry roar from her motor. Desperately, Lonnie grabbed for the useless handbrake and stamped the footbrake to the floor, 
but Shiftless paid no more attention to him than if he'd been a fly on her windshield. She seemed to have decided it was time she took matters into her own hands, and maybe it was just as well that she did. Lonnie was so busy fighting the useless control pedals that he never once turned his head to see where we were going. I did, and for a few seconds I thought it would depend on the lives we'd led. The road we were careening down backwards was no more than a pair of rough wheel ruts curving around the shoulder of a canyon wall. On the outside of the curve, there was a sheer drop-off of 30 feet or more. On the outside, the cliff rose straight up with a rubble of broken stone at its base. As if Shiftless were human and could see where she was going, she followed the wheel ruts around the curve for a hundred feet or more, bouncing and pitching wildly. Then at the only spot where the rubble heap was wide enough to have held her, she leaped out of the ruts, backed onto it, and came to a neck-cracking stop, her engine still roaring defiantly. For a few moments, both Lonnie and I were too numb to think or move. Then he reached for the ignition switch as if in a dream and said, Jeepers creepers, buddy, we must have sheared off the half-moon key. The whole thing had happened so fast that neither of us had time to become frightened, only numbed. But when Lonnie spoke, it broke the tension and our nerves let go. For two or three minutes, we just sat there, shaking as if we had chills and fever. As soon as I could speak without my voice quavering, I asked, What's the half-moon key? The key that wedges the drive shaft into the main driving gear, he told me. Shear it off when your handbrake's petered out the likes of ours, and you ain't got no more control over a Ford than a bicycle that's thrown its chain, because the foot brake is on the shaft. Well, I guess we're licked, I told him. It would cost more than old Shiftless is worth to have her hauled to a garage from way out here. Aw, oh, jeepers, buddy, Lonnie wailed. You're all the time running Shiftless down. It wasn't no fault of hers. She only done it because we fixed the engine up too good. Made it too stout for that little itty-bitty key. It won't cost next to nothing to fix her up good as new again. Them keys only costs a nickel apiece. Tell you what we'll do, buddy. You make camp and I'll hike back and get one. It was already growing dark, so I told Lonnie there was no use in starting out for the key till morning. Then we got out and looked Shiftless over to see how much damage she'd done herself when she backed up onto the rubble heap. It didn't amount to much of anything. The gasoline tank was battered in but not broken through. One fender was crumpled, the taillight was smashed, and there were three or four big dents in the body, but the axle and wheels were undamaged. The only place to make camp was right there in the roadway, but we weren't much worried about the traffic, so we built our fire between the wheel ruts, ate our supper, and spread our bedrolls. I'd push pushed Shiftless up so many hills that I was bushed. I couldn't wash the dishes because all the water we had was in the radiator, and it turned cold at sundown, so we rolled in between the blankets as soon as we'd eaten. As always, Lonnie was in first, for he never bothered to take off anything but his hat, boots, and breeches. He was already snoring by the time I'd crawled into my roll and pulled the tarpaulin up over me. The next thing I knew I was awakened, half frozen, and sure I'd heard some strange sound. The night was coal black and bitter cold, but I threw the tarp back and sat up to listen. From the direction of the rubble heap where Shiftless was perched, I heard the intermittent sound of rocks being grated against each other. There could be no doubt that something was prowling around on the rubble, something big and heavy. Suddenly there was a ring of tin against stone. That sound could have only been made by our dishpan. I was sure that some large wild animal, probably a bear, had smelled our food supply and was into it. And if we lost that, we really were licked. I didn't have nerve enough to launch an attack in the blackness, so I felt quietly around until I'd found a rock the size of a baseball and yelled, Get out of here! and heaved it. Lonnie's howl and the sound of broken glass came back before the last word was out of my mouth. Cheebers creepers, buddy, what got into you? he shouted from the blackness. You went and busted the windshield. And you dang near brained me. What in the world are you doing out there? I shouted back. Drain in the radiator, he hollered as if I were a mile away. What else would I be doing? Leave old shiftless freeze up solid on a night the likes of this and she'd be ruined. It would bust the engine block and then where'd we be at? It seemed to me that might be the best thing that could happen to me. It would be as easy to walk and carry my outfit as to push shiftless up every hill and a lot cheaper, but it would have only hurt Lonnie's feelings to tell him so and he already felt bad enough about my having broken the windshield. I just pulled the tarp up over me and was asleep before he came back to bed. The next morning was freezing cold, but I rousted Lonnie out at noon as I had the fire. No, nope. I rousted Lonnie out as soon as I had the fire built and breakfast on to cook. By half an hour after sunup, he'd shown me what I'd have to do while he was gone, and had started back to get a half moon key, a dollar in his pocket, a loaf of gluten bread under one arm, and two cans of salmon under the other. I didn't expect to see Lonnie again for a couple of days. It was nearly 40 miles back to Mesa, and since leaving, we hadn't passed any place where he might get a half-moon key. 
The job he'd left me was a big one, but there was no need to hurry on it. He said I'd have to jack shiftless up, block her on stones, take the rear axle off, and the differential housing apart. That was the only way we could get the broken key out and put the new one in. I didn't have to jack shiftless up, just wedge big rocks under her frame, right where she was perched, then work others out from under her hind wheels until they were hanging free. But the taking apart was rough. The only tools we had were the set wrench that had come with her, an old monkey wrench that slipped open if I put too much strain on it, a battered old carpenter's hammer, and a pair of pliers. Every bolt was rusted solidly into place, and no one of them took me less than an hour before I was able to fight it loose. It was nearly sundown, and I was still fighting the last bolt when I heard a clattering of stones on the far side of the canyon. Again, I thought it must be a bear, grabbed the hammer in one hand and the monkey wrench in the other, and wriggled out from under shiftless. It wasn't a bear. It was Lonnie. He was riding a horse without saddle or bridle down the steep roadway at a pounding trot. As he crossed the bottom of the canyon and started upwards, still at a trot, he shouted, I got it, buddy, I got it. Had to go clean into Mesa. Where did you get that horse, I shouted back, and how did you make it so fast? Borrowed him, borrowed three, four of them, Lonnie told me as he rode up and slid to the ground. Jeepers, wished I'd thought to take along my saddle, my behinds dang near worn to hamburger. I could only take Lonnie's word for his own condition, but it was easy to see that the horse was nearly worn to hamburger. He stood with his head hanging to the ground and his sides heaving. Lonnie wouldn't go mu into much detail, but admitted he'd swiped a horse at the first ranch he came to, and had traded off whenever he had a chance. When I told him he was going to get us into bad trouble, he only laughed and told me, Shucks, buddy, I ain't stole nothing. Them nags all headed for home again as quick as they ever could catch their breath. As if the horse he'd ridden into camp had understood him, he turned and plodded off down the road. It took us only a couple of hours the next morning to put old Shiftless back together, but it took us two more days to cover the 30 miles to Roosevelt. Each hill was steeper than the one before it. Shiftless boiled from morning till night. The hotshot battery went completely dead. And the only way we could get the engine started in the mornings was by camping at the top of a hill so we could get coasting fast before we threw it into gear. Before we reached Roosevelt, we'd eaten everything we had except cabbage, canned salmon, and gluten flour. And we'd have run out of gas and oil if a rancher hadn't sold us some. That's the most we got out of any cattleman we went to see. The rest of them just shook their heads and told us to come back to see them in the spring. We decided that the best thing we could do was to turn southeast and get down to Globe, where I could see a doctor and we could pick up some more grub. It took us three more days to get as far as Globe. We followed every wagon track that led off the road so as to be sure we wouldn't miss a ranch where we might find jobs, but all the good it did was that Lonnie managed to mooch a few free meals. I spent most of one night trying to make gluten bread, but I guess I'd let my sourdough get too cold some night when we'd been in the mountains. It was just milky slop when I poured it into the flour, and it turned out to be as dead as our hotshot battery. The bread baked all right in the Dutch oven, but it came out like the stuff the cook in Tucson made for me. The only way I could eat it was by holding a chunk in my mouth until it softened up enough to chew, or by soaking it in some juice at the bottom of a can of salmon. I tried boil boiling some of it with the cabbage, but it all went to mush and spoiled the taste of the cabbage. And that is the end of chapter 8. Bye-bye, everybody.